OK. Euh, bonjour et merci de vous être joints à nous aujourd'hui. Je voudrais d'abord dire un mot aux enfants canadiens. Je sais que c'est une période très difficile pour vous quand vous êtes prise à la maison et ne pouvez pas aller voir vos amis. Par contre, dimanche, c'est la fête des mères. Si vous pouvez, donnez un gros câlin à votre maman et peut-être aider votre famille à nettoyer la maison. Je suis certaine que toutes les mamans à travers le Canada apprécieraient ce beau cadeau. So I'd like to start by saying something to all the poor children of Canada. I know that this is such a difficult time for you, cooped up at home and not able to go and play with your friends. But Sunday is Mother's Day, and I would really like to say, if you can, give your mother a hug, give her a kiss. If you can, maybe help clean up the house a little bit. Uh, I know it's hard for you, but it is really also a hard time for parents across the country. And I know your parents and especially your mothers will really, really, would really, really appreciate it. And in the interests of disclosure, I must say I do have a personal interest in sharing this message with the children of Canada. So today we will hear from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Howard New, by video link, our Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion, Carla Qualtro, par videoconférence, le Ministre du Patrimoine canadien, Stephen Guilbeault, by video link, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, Navdeep Baines, et le Président du Conseil du Trésor, Jean-Yves Duclos. Dr. Tam, please. Good afternoon and bonjour à toutes et à tous. I'll start with the latest numbers on COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 65,399 confirmed cases, including 4,471 deaths, and 29,000, or 45 percent, of cases have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 1,032,000 people for COVID-19, with about 6% of these testing positive to date. In the past week, we've tested an average over, of over 26,000 people daily. We've had quite a few questions about lab testing uh, capacity versus our daily lab testing levels. So I want to take a moment to explain this a little bit further. To be clear, when we talked about a current lab capacity to do 60,000 tests a day in Canada, this is about building up our ability to detect any surge in cases as we relax public health measures. Specifically, a robust testing capacity is a vital component of our case finding, contact tracing, isolation and quarantine approach to rapidly corner the virus. So how do we know we are testing enough? One relatively simple international benchmark for testing is the percentage of tests that come back positive. The lower the percentage of positive tests, the better your surveillance is. When the positive test is really high, it means you're missing a lot of infections. The WHO benchmark is to aim for a positivity rate of 10% or below, striking the balance between casting the net wide, that is high sensitivity, while targeting testing where the virus is most likely to be spreading. Canada has maintained the percentage positive rate below 10% throughout the epidemic. Most encouragingly, our average weekly percent positive rate has been declining from 9.8% in early April to about 4% now in early May. At the same time, we have doubled the number of people being tested weekly since early April, indicating we are casting the net wide. Right now, our testing strategy is evolving as the epidemic slows. In many areas of Canada, testing is broadening to include people with a range of milder symptoms. Provinces and territories are increasing their testing to target people working or living in higher risk settings, such as health care, long-term care, correctional facilities, certain work and congregate living settings. 
When it comes to testing, it's not the number that matters so much, but knowing that you are testing the right people at the right time in the right place. There are multiple other ways that have been proposed to gauge whether countries are testing enough. Regardless of the method, Canada stacks up well against other countries, but we can always do better. This is why we continue to increase our testing capacity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. Et maintenant, je donne la parole au Dr. Howard New. Dr. New, s'il vous plaît. Okay. Merci. Bonjour. Comme d'habitude, je commencerai par faire le point sur le nombre de cas de COVID-19 au Canada. On dénombre actuellement 65 399 cas confirmés, dont 4 471 décès et 20 000 29 000 personnes rétablies, c'était de 45 %. Jusqu'ici, les, le, le, les laboratoires du Canada ont procédé à l'analyse de plus de 1 million 32 000 tests de dépistage et environ 6 % des tests à date se sont révélés positifs. Au, cœur de, au cours de la semaine dernière, nous avons testé en moyenne plus de 25 000 personnes par jour. De nombreuses questions nous ont été posées, concernant la capacité des laboratoires par rapport à notre volume quotidien de tests en laboratoire. Je prends donc quelques instants pour donner plus de détails. De manière claire, lorsque nous avons parlé de la capacité actuelle des laboratoires à effectuer 60 000 tests par jour au Canada, il s'agissait de renforcer notre capacité à détecter toute augmentation subite de nombre de cas pendant l'assouplissement des mesures de santé publique. Plus précisément, une grande capacité d'analyse est un élément essentiel de notre approche des détections des cas, de recherche de contact, d'isolement et de mise en quarantaine pour rapidement cerner le virus. Alors, comment savoir si nous effectuons suffisamment des de de tests? Il existe un point de référence international relativement simple pour les tests à savoir le pourcentage de tests qui sont positifs. Plus le pourcentage de tests positifs est faible, meilleure est la surveillance. Lorsque le taux de résultats positifs est très élevé, c'est que beaucoup d'infections nous échappent. Le point de référence de l'OMS est de viser un taux de positivité d'au plus 10 % en trouvant un équilibre entre le fait de ratisser large, ça veut dire haute sensibilité, tout en ciblant les tests là où le virus est est le plus susceptible de se propager. Le Canada a maintenu un taux de positivité de moins de 10 % depuis le début des débuts de l'épidémie. Plus encourageant encore, notre taux de positivité quotidien moyen est en baisse. Il est passé de 9,8 % au début d'avril à environ 4 % au début mai. En même temps, nous avons doublé le nombre de tests effectués chaque semaine depuis le début avril ce qui indique que nous ratissons assez large. En ce moment, notre stratégie concernant les tests évolue alors que l'épidémie ralentit. Dans de nombreuses régions du Canada, on élargit le dépistage pour inclure les personnes présentant une gamme de symptômes plus faible. Les provinces et les territoires augmentent leur capacité de tests pour cibler les personnes qui travaillent et habitent dans les milieux à haut risque, comme celles dans les centres de soins de santé, les centres de soins de longue durée, les établissements correctionnels et dans certains milieux de travail et d'hébergement en commun. Lorsqu'on effectue des tests, ce n'est donc pas tant le nombre qui importe, mais le fait de savoir que nous testons les bonnes personnes au bon moment, au bon endroit. De multiples autres façons ont été proposées pour déterminer si le pays effectue assez de tests. Peu importe la méthode utilisée, Le Canada se compare avantageusement aux autres pays, mais nous pouvons toujours faire mieux et c'est pour cette raison que nous continuons d'accroître notre capacité de test. Merci. Merci, Dr. Knoul. And now I will turn it over to Carla Qualtro. Carla, please. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Today's numbers of 2 million jobs lost in April show that COVID-19 is having a real impact on communities and families right across the country. Since the beginning of this crisis, we've been focused on providing Canadians with the support they need as we work together to contain the spread of the virus and on ensuring we have the tools in place to keep our people safe. 
C'est pour cela que notre gouvernement a pris des mesures sans précédent afin d'appuyer les Canadiens et leurs familles durant cette période difficile. We introduced the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to help keep as many Canadians as possible working. To help Canadians who have lost income due to COVID-19, we introduced the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which provides $2,000 a month to those who need it most. Along the way, we've worked to ensure this benefit is as inclusive as possible to reflect the different realities that Canadians face. To date, over 7 million Canadians have access to the service. We know that today's job numbers also demonstrate the real challenges that young people are currently facing in our country. While many have been able to access a CERB, many other young Canadians are anxious about their employment prospects, especially this summer. That's why we announced the Canada Emergency Student Benefit. Students who are not eligible for the CERB will be able to apply to receive $1,250 per month between May and August. Students with permanent disabilities and those with dependents could receive an additional $750 per month. We know that you have additional expenses during this crisis, and we are here to support you. I'm happy to say that we'll have more details about the application process for the CESB soon. In the meantime, eligible students should set up their MyCRA account to set themselves for direct deposit so that when applications begin, they can get their first payment very, very shortly. Ces initiatives ainsi que la bonification de l'allocation canadienne pour enfants et du crédit pour la TPS permettent aux familles d'avoir rapidement plus d'argent dans leurs poches au moment où elles ont le plus besoin. As provinces begin to lift restrictions and our government continues to take steps toward economic recovery, we'll be there for Canadians. We'll get through these challenging times together. Thank you. Merci. Okay, thank you, Carla. And maintenant, je donne la parole à Stephen Gilbo, le ministre du Patrimoine canadien. Stephen, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Christia. Bonjour, tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Our culture, heritage, and sports sectors are going through a major crisis. They are under enormous financial pressures because of the isolation measures that deprive them of the, uh, their audience and their income. The situation is critical. We've moved quickly to stabilize these sectors, which are an important driver of the Canadian economy. On April 17th, the Government of Canada announced a fund of up to $500 million to help the cultural, heritage, and sports sectors. Today, I'm pleased to announce the details, as I know that many are eager to hear more. Le fonds sera distribué en deux phases et servira notamment à répondre aux besoins financiers des organismes touchés, à maintenir les emplois et à favoriser la continuité des activités des organismes dont les flux de trésorerie et la viabilité opérationnelle à court terme sont entravés par la pandémie. Le fonds vient compléter le plan d'intervention économique du Canada pour répondre à la crise de la COVID-19 afin que personne ne soit laissé pour compte. Canadian Heritage will distribute financial support through its program and will work closely with its partners, specifically the Canada Council for the Arts, the Canada Media Fund, Factor, Music Action, and Telefilm Canada. Nos décisions en ce qui a trait au financement tiendront compte des communautés traditionnellement marginalisées, ainsi que des communautés LGBTQ2, les communautés autochtones et de langues officielles en situation minoritaire. Full details can be found on the Canadian Heritage website. Our program officers will be in direct contact with the organizations through the usual communications channels starting today. They will do everything they can to address the most pressing concerns. We know that organizations are facing all kinds of serious challenges right now and are doing their best to get through it all. This is why we've put in place put together a streamlined process to distribute these funds. Nos gens du patrimoine, créateurs et athlètes jouent un rôle essentiel pour bâtir des communautés saines, soudées, inclusives et fières au Canada. Durant, durant le confinement, ils nous ont aidés à nous sentir un peu moins seuls. Leur résilience et leurs gestes de solidarité font chaud au cœur. Ils sont toujours là pour nous et nous voulons être là pour eux. Canadians stand behind our creators, artists and athletes. And we have a message for them. We miss you. We need you. And we will meet again in person. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Stephen. Uh, now we are going to hear from the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, Navdeep Baines. Please, Nav. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christia, and good afternoon, everyone. Since the beginning of this crisis, our goal has been to do everything we can to assist our frontline workers and to ensure the safety and support of Canadians as we navigate this pandemic and these unprecedented economic times. As today's job numbers show, many people are hurting because of COVID-19. Nous savons que les travailleurs de certains secteurs ont été touchés très durement. Nous devons bien comprendre leurs défis et nous devons continuer à les appuyer. Our approach is to be proactive and strategic and designed to bring the private sector to the table to directly share their perspectives on the scope of the challenges being faced. As our government examines what is needed in this immediate crisis, we need to fully understand all of the challenges. Effective immediately, we're establishing an industry strategy council tasked with helping us identify these challenges. The council will leverage an existing and trusted, trusted public-private form known as Canada's economic strategy tables, where business leaders can share perspectives regarding the challenges they're facing as a result of COVID-19. In response to some particular pr pressures related to the pandemic, we're adding two new tables, representing the retail and transportation sectors. They join our existing tables, which have been represented by advanced manufacturing, agri-food, clean technology, digital industries, health and bioscience, tourism and hospitality, and resources of the future. Les membres du Conseil vont rencontrer régulièrement au cours des 90 jours à venir. Ils vont cibler les pressions sectorielles qui touchent notre économie. Le Conseil va nous aider à mieux comprendre ces précisions. These pressures range from workforce disruptions to reestablishment of supply chains and consumer confidence, to name a few. Je remercie Monique Leroux d'avoir accepté notre invitation de présider le Conseil. Madame Leroux a mené une carrière exceptionnelle en finance. Sa grande ex expertise en fait la personne idéale pour diriger le Conseil. And we will be announcing the rest of the council members in the coming days. Just as we've seen with industry stepping up to assist with personal protective equipment production and medical countermeasures, we are going to work in collaboration with our industry to understand and to make sure that we come out of this stronger and we come out of this together. And with the help of the Industry Strategy Council, we'll do exactly that. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Okay, thank you, Nav. Uh, maintenant, je donne la parole à Jean-Yves Duclos, le président du Conseil du Trésor. Jean-Yves, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Christia, et bonjour à tout le monde. Le message du premier ministre ce matin, c'est un message d'espoir et de courage à la lumière des résultats de l'enquête sur la population active de Statistique Canada portant sur l'emploi et le chômage. Comme économiste, ces statistiques sont choquantes, mais comme député, ces statistiques sont bouleversantes, puisque derrière les chiffres, il y a dans nos circonscriptions des milliers de travailleurs et de familles qui sont affectés par la crise. Heureusement, nous pouvons compter les uns sur les autres pour passer à travers cette crise avec les mesures que le gouvernement canadien a déjà annoncées, soit la prestation canadienne d'urgence, les prêts d'urgence, mais aussi la subvention salariale d'urgence que le premier ministre a mentionné encore ce matin et dont l'échéance va être reportée. Et c'est dans un contexte où on sait qu'après la, après la crise, si on continue à prendre soin les uns les autres, on sera non seulement plus fort, mais aussi plus solidaire les uns des autres. Merci, Christian. Merci, Jean-Yves. OK, on est prêt à répondre à vos questions. Carl, s'il vous plaît. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. As usual, we'll start on the phone with three questions. One question, one follow-up, and then we'll turn to the room. Operator. Thank you. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. Please vous appuyer sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. The first question, la première question, est de Marie Vastel du Devoir. À vous la parole. 
Oui, bonjour. Ma question est pour ma, la ministre Quattro. C'est au sujet de la prestation canadienne d'urgence. Les écoles, les garderies commencent à rouvrir leurs portes, notamment au Québec lundi. Et on entend des, des enseignantes ou des, des éducatrices de garderies qui estiment que leur retour au travail ne serait pas ou serait une menace à leur sécurité et à leur santé. J'aimerais savoir, euh, est-ce que une euh, évaluation personnelle euh, qu'un qu retour au travail est dangereux, dangereux pour sa santé est suffisant pour euh, réclamer ou continuer de réclamer la PCU? Est-ce qu'une personne peut décider d'elle-même de ne pas retourner travailler et avoir droit à la PCU? Carla? Merci pour la question très importante. Euh, nous voulons bien sûr être certains que les travailleurs soient sécuritaires dans leur environnement, dans leur milieu de travail, excuse-moi, et nous expectons que les, les milieux de travail font tout ce qu'ils peuvent pour assurer la sécurité de les travailleurs. Euh, en travaillant de proche avec les officiels de la santé publique, nous, il y a des guides pour les employeurs pour être certains que les milieux de travail sont sécuritaires. Euh, bien sûr, euh, une personne qui est travailleur ou travailleuse euh, a le droit de refuser de, de travailler si il, il, il ou elle ne se sent pas sécuritaire. Mais pour nous, le but, c'est de, de travailler avec les milieux de travail, les employeurs, pour que les, ces milieux soient plus sécuritaires, que, les, que tous les travailleurs ont la confiance que leur, leur sécurité, leur santé, c'est exactement la priorité pour les employeurs. Follow-up. Donc, vous dites que euh, la personne a le droit de ne pas refuser. Donc, les éducatrices en garderie, par exemple, peuvent refuser d'aller travailler et continuer de toucher la PCU. Est-ce que euh, le versement va être accepté? Um, la PCU est, est disponible pour uh, tout le monde qui ne travaille pas à cause des raisons de la COVID-19. Uh, on ne peut pas quitter le travail, mais si vous ne travaillez pas pour les raisons de la COVID, vous êtes uh, éligible. C'est vraiment un choix personnel, mais je dois renforcer le message que nous voulons que les personnes travaillent, nous voulons que les personnes retournent au travail et que les employeurs uh, créent des environnements, des milieux de travail sécuritaire et où la santé, c'est la première chose euh, à penser. Thank you, Minister. Opérateur, prochaine question, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question, is from Mike Blanchfield from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Oh, hello, Deputy Prime Minister. This question is for you. Um, the job loss numbers out today are at historic levels in both Canada and the U.S., and yet we're seeing dramatically different responses. There's pressure in the U.S. to reopen the economy and get back to work, but that hasn't seemed to manifest itself in Canada in the same way. How do you explain the difference? Uh, thanks for the question, Mike, and it's nice to hear your voice. Um, you are absolutely right that the jobs numbers are uh, historic and uh, are and should be profoundly worrying for all Canadians. Uh, our country is going through a very, very trying economic time. In terms of what that means when it comes to our government response and to the response of Canadians across the country, I think Canadians are so smart and they are so sensible. We all knew we all understood that physical distancing, that shutting the country down was an essential response to the coronavirus. We understood that, we got that, and I'm so proud of Canadians for following that advice. And the good news is, as a result of following that advice, we are making real progress in beating the virus. The same sensible, prudent, smart approach needs to guide the restart. And I think Canadians understand profoundly that the biggest mistake we could make right now 
would be to squander our hard-won gains. It has been really tough to get here, and the, the job numbers today show what a big sacrifice we have been making. Our job now, collectively, is to build on that progress and to be sure that as we look towards restarting the economy, we do it very carefully, very prudently, and in a way that will prevent the virus from surging back and enveloping us all. What that does mean, that careful, prudent, smart approach, is that the government has to be there to support Canadians who are doing the right thing. And that is why our government has put in place the largest economic program in Canadian history to support Canadians and to support Canadian companies. We are making really good progress. There is still a way to go in the fight against the virus. And as the Prime Minister said earlier today, the government is here to support Canadians, to support businesses as we finish off that fight. We're going to get there. Mike, follow up. Uh, yes, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Well, given this uh, hard uh, effort that has gone into all of this to get us to this point, um, what are you saying in your discussions to the United States about um, about um, the uneven approach that's taking place down there? And what concerns are you expressing about how this might affect Canada, given that it's our largest economic partner, our neighbor, and we share a border with them? Well, let me uh, just say, Mike, first of all, that we had a very productive conversation yesterday, the Prime Minister and the Premiers. I was fortunate enough to be able to be part of that conversation, too, um, about the restart, about the continued efforts to fight the coronavirus, uh, and also about our border with the United States. Um, in terms of our conversations with the United States, uh, you know, they have been... Uh, very appropriate to our relationship. They have been really neighborly. They've been really practical and really effective. The border measures that we have put in place, which are unprecedented and have restricted non-essential travel but have allowed essential travel to continue, have really worked. And our uh, experience of them in Canada is that those border measures have cut down travel across the border very, very much. But at the same time, essential travel continues. We have been in touch with our American partners, and they have exactly the same experience on their side of the border. So that shows that they are really effective. And I think that that is really positive for Canada, for Canadians, for our economy, and it speaks well of our relationship. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question, is de Micheline Laflamme de Radio-Canada. A vous la parole. Merci. Uh, Monsieur Baines, uh, vous allez diriger le Conseil sur la stratégie industrielle. Alors, qu'est-ce que vous attendez de ce Conseil? Il va se réunir, uh, vous dites, dans les 90 prochains jours. Donc, at vous attendez-vous à des recommandations à court terme? Et surtout, quel secteur économique va-t-il analyser en priorité? Uh, so, merci pour votre question. Uh, je voudrais souligner l'importance uh, d'avoir un uh, leader exceptionnel. Uh, Monique Alero, c'est un leader dans plusieurs secteurs, automobile, télécommunication et les commerces de détail. Uh, so, elle a beaucoup d'expérience. So, je suis certain qu'elle va travailler avec moi et mes collègues de déterminer quels problèmes qui existent dans tous les secteurs. Et pour le moment, nous devons cibler les, les crises maintenant parce que la situation est très grave et très sérieuse. Et avec le temps, j'espère que nous pouvons continuer à trouver les solutions qui peuvent améliorer les conditions pour les travailleurs. Micheline, on suivi? Oui, et... Euh... Enfin, Madame Freeland ou Monsieur Baines, euh, on sait que les grands fabricants de l'automobile aux États-Unis vont reprendre leurs activités prochainement. Alors, euh, en avez-vous discuté avec vos homologues américains 
et comment la réouverture des usines au Canada va-t-elle s'effectuer? Euh, je vais commencer. Peut-être Nerv va ajouter quelque chose parce que je sais que Nerv travaille en étroite collaboration avec notre euh, industrie d'automobile. <rire> euh, oui, c'est une euh, très bonne question euh, et c'est euh, vraiment un élément de notre coordination, de notre collaboration avec nos partenaires américains. Euh, je sais que l'industrie d'automobile canadienne est très bien intégré avec euh, ses homologues aux États-Unis. Euh, notre industrie a aussi beaucoup d'expérience internationale en travaillant dans les conditions du coronavirus. Beaucoup euh, des entreprises canadiennes travaillent aujourd'hui en Chine dans les conditions du travail, mais les conditions euh, dans lesquelles le coronavirus est présent. Alors, je sais que notre industrie a beaucoup d'expérience, beaucoup de connaissances de ce qu'on doit faire. Et l'industrie travaille en étroite collaboration avec le fédéral, avec les homologues américains et aussi avec les provinces. Est-ce que tu veux ajouter quelque chose? Oui, je suis d'accord avec euh, ma collègue. Uh, elle a raison. Uh, la situation uh, est maintenant avec, uh, aux États-Unis est très simple. Nous devons travailler ensemble parce que le secteur automobile uh, existe dans, au Canada et au, aux États-Unis. L'intégration est absolument essentielle. Pour la première priorité est la sécurité des travailleurs. So nous allons examiner la situation à chaque jour. But je suis certain que le secteur va trouver les solutions qui, qui va uh, aider uh, les travailleurs. Thank you, Minister. We will now turn to the room, starting with Rachel Hans from CTV. Um, hi, ministers and uh, doctors. Rachel Haynes from CTV National News. Um, my first question actually goes to Dr. Tam uh, about the outbreak at the Cargill Meat uh, facility and the outbreak in High River as well. We've seen a large number of people who have been infected there, but um, a small number of deaths in that community. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think that is when there is such a large outbreak that there would be such a small number of fatalities? So obviously the uh, province of Alberta is working extremely hard and my uh, colleague, um, um, the Chief Medical Officer of Health there, so they are um, you know, providing guidance to the industry and trying to as rapidly as possible get these outbreaks under control. Uh, in terms of um, deaths, I mean obviously right now the outbreak is still undergoing evolution, but we know that the um, the, the, the fatalities mainly occur in people over um, um, a certain age, so it's definitely over 60, but obviously at 70 or 80 years old, you're at a higher risk. So I think part of this might be related to the uh, age groups that might be affected. Uh, but we also know that it's not just the workers, it could be their families, so it may depend on what families are, um, the workers might be living with, for example. But we do know that um, the... Um, case fatality is driven uh, you know, very much by the long-term care facility outbreaks right now. So I think the work environment is, is different, um, but it is definitely um, a work a setting where um, you know, really rapid response when we get cases um, you know, in terms of testing and, and case finding and contact tracing is very important. Uh, thank you. And my next question um, is a bit of uh, a two-parter um, for Mr. Duclos and uh, Minister Freeland. About the uh, wage subsidy, Mr. Uh, Duclos, you said a few days ago that a business would start seeing that wage subsidy. So have all businesses who have been approved gotten that money? And as well, um, the Prime Minister did say earlier today that um, as we start to reopen economies, more people will be going back to work and will need the wage subsidy more so than the CERB. But for businesses who have had to shutter completely, for those people and after June when they don't get the CERB anymore, what, what is available to them? Thank you. If I may start with the statistics on the, the, the emergency wage subsidies. So as of yesterday, 120,000 businesses 
had um, applied, and almost a almost 100,000, I think the precise number is 97,000 of them had their application approved for a total of 1.7 million workers. So these are a large number of workers, and we are very um, not only proud of the impact of that, uh, of that program, but we're also very mindful that this is going to be important as we move forward. As you said, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the value and the objective of that program was to maintain the important relationship work the worker employer relationship as we move through the crisis and the great news is that a number of businesses and we expect that to be uh, continually uh, improving a number of these businesses so we are going to be able to maintain that important relationship and as the prime minister announced this morning we believe that it's important to extend that uh, that wage subsidies so that uh, businesses have the ability to hire even more workers on the wage subsidies yeah and i'll just add i mean i very much agree with John Eve, and I would just add uh, the wage subsidy program is really, really important, particularly now as we are able to begin looking cautiously with great prudence towards economic reopening because we really all appreciate that the reopening is going to have to be very careful and very gradual. And what the wage subsidy does is it allows a business to operate even not at full capacity. And it allows that business, which is operating not at full capacity, to continue to employ and pay its workers. And I think that it has been, the wage subsidy has been a great tool so far. I think we're going to find it to be an even more valuable tool as we carefully move towards reopening our economy businesses who have shuttered and won't be reopening even in the next few months? Well, there is an, an ability for not only uh, rehiring, but hiring uh, workers and new workers included. So it's designed in a manner that gives the businesses the flexibility on the decision and the timing of the decision that they want to uh, to use. So it's, uh, it's, it's designed for that particular purpose. We understand that businesses have faced the crisis in many different ways and that they may want to start hiring new workers at different times, and that's why extending this wage subsidies is important. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. On va repasser au téléphone pour trois questions, opérateur. Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question, is de Emily Bergeron de l'agence QMI. À vous la parole. Oui, bonjour. Ma question est pour euh, Monsieur Duclos. Euh, au sujet de la subvention salariale, euh, où en fait, euh, Madame Faltrow, euh, la, donc euh, avec l'allongement, euh, le prolongement de la durée, à combien pourrait s'élever le coût euh, de cette mesure? Selon le directeur parlementaire du budget, on était rendu à 76 milliards pour cette mesure-là. Donc, à combien ça s'élèverait de plus? Et aussi, des demandes qui ont été reçues, combien ont été traitées jusqu'à présent? Bon, sur la question de, des, des impacts fiscaux de cette mesure, évidemment, il est, même si on aimerait être plus clair, il est difficile de l'être en ce moment parce qu'on est vraiment en période de grande inconnue. Et euh, le directeur parlementaire du budget a fait un très bon travail de prévision, mais ce n'est pas un travail de précision. Donc, il faut reconnaître qu'on est encore trop tôt dans le processus pour avoir une idée non seulement de l'impact jusqu'au 6 juin, mais de l'impact qu'il va y avoir de prolonger euh, cette subvention salariale après euh, le 6 euh, juin. Et euh, sur la question de... Bon, J'ai déjà oublié. Euh, Émilie, vous pouvez la rappeler, votre, votre, votre deuxième partie de question oui. Euh, oui, sur euh, les demandes qui ont été euh, reçues, il y en a combien qui ont été traitées jusqu'à présent? Pardon. Donc, 120 000 demandes ont été reçues, 97 000 ont été traitées pour un total de 1,7 million de travailleurs. Harley, est-ce que tu veux ajouter quelque chose? Uh, Christian, j'ajouterais que c'est très important de... Nous, nous ne savons pas encore l'interaction entre le PCU et la subvention salariale. Alors, nous, nous, 
nous suivons cette euh, interaction de très proche, mais dans les semaines précédentes, nous allons mieux comprendre, probablement les, les, les semaines qui viennent, nous allons mieux comprendre euh, combien de travailleurs quittent le PCU et qui vont à la, la subvention salariale. Ça, ça va être un moment très important pour nous. Merci, Madame la ministre. Émilie, en suivi eh oui, merci. Euh, une deuxième question peut-être pour Mme Freeland. Euh, il y a beaucoup de travailleurs de, de préposés aux bénéficiaires dans les CHSLD, des établissements pour aînés, euh, qui sont euh, des demandeurs d'asile qui se sont vus refuser leur, euh, leur demande d'asile. On pense par exemple à des Haïtiens qui sont arrivés en, en 2017 et, et qui aujourd'hui euh, travaillent d'arrache-pied et, et euh, risquent parfois leur, leur vie. Est-ce que vous songez à régulariser leur statut? Euh, merci pour la question. Et je voudrais commencer en remerciant à tous les gens qui travaillent pour aider nos années dans des conditions très difficiles, très dangereuses. Ils font un travail absolument essentiel. Et je veux souligner... Euh, aussi le travail des femmes et des hommes des forces armées canadiennes qui font aussi ce travail. Merci beaucoup. Vous faites une chose énormément importante pour notre pays. Euh, concernant euh, la question des demandeurs d'asile, comme vous savez très bien, le Canada a un système, un système juste, a un système très bien réglé pour décider qui a le droit d'asile au Canada. Et c'est important pour nous d'être un pays des droits euh, et on continuera d'être ça. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Operator, next question, please. Thank you, merci. The next question, la prochaine question, is from Althea Raj from HuffPost Canada. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. My question is for Dr. Tim. I'd like to go back on the comments that you made at the outset um, of the meeting. You said, repeated basically, that the 60,000 is the public health laboratory capacity. Now, that's been explained to us that that is the amount of tests that can be done daily. If we are only doing an average of 26,000 tests, what is the problem? Do we not have enough tests? Do we not have enough people to administer the tests? What's preventing us from going to 26 to 60? Thank you. Um, there's a number of factors. Uh, uh, that is the capacity of the public health laboratories. And what you want to do as you um, progress in this epidemic curve is to flexibly uh, escalate uh, testing as needed. So uh, if you were in a certain province where the outbreak is actually under control, Um, right now, those provinces are increasing their testing, not because they've got cases uh, necessarily identified right now, but they are widening the net to test more people with, say, milder symptoms. So they, they may increase in testing just by widening the net just to see if there's any ongoing uh, community transmission, for example. Other provinces are in a very different situation, for example, of course, in Quebec and uh, Montreal, where they, they are escalating uh, testing right now um, to um, do broadening testing in that area where they're actually still having some outbreaks, uh, knowing that outbreaks are occurring in uh, their long-term care facilities, but also trying to see if there's any uh, transmission that is happening in the community. So you are seeing them escalate the testing uh, to fit with the epidemiological needs, which is why I think part of it is that, um, you know, just it, there is no magic target to just keep testing at a certain number. It depends on where that uh, epidemiology is at. But uh, only to say that all provinces are looking at ways at which they make sure, you know, when we're in the middle of that epidemic curve, a lot of people were told to stay at home. And if you got milder symptoms, Um, you may call your health line and talk, talk about when you get tested, but many of them would have um, um, actually um, sort of stayed at home and their symptoms would have um, um, essentially resolved and they would then be able to uh, continue. But in this newer uh, stage, these people will now be able to get tested, for example. That's how I think the numbers might go up, but it will go up and down. 
Uh, the percent positive tells us a little bit about um, how sensitive that system is. And for many of the provinces, they're at a very low percentage right, right, right now, which means while they're doing more testing, they're not detecting those positives. So it's not a straightforward, you know, we must reach a certain number of tests per day. I think that will still fluctuate. The important thing is we've got that buffer, we've got that surge, so that if there is a case or a cluster, uh, the local area will be able to jump on that and rapidly increase their testing uh, as needed as well. So that's the sort of idea going into that next phase. Altia, follow up? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate all that you've said, and I think that you've kind of made these points repeatedly uh, throughout the week. And we understand that the provinces are basically using their resources as best as they can to address their own uh, unique challenges. But my question is, why are we not testing more? What's the like? What is preventing us from going from 26 to whatever the magic number may be? It doesn't really matter what the magic number is. But you've both you and the health minister have both said that we need to have. Uh, more testing capacity. We need to increase that. We need to have more tests done. More people need to be tested. So why are we not testing more people? You said there were a number of factors. Can you elaborate? What are those factors? Do we have enough tests? Do we have enough people to administer the tests? Why are we not testing more? So I think it depends on where you're at in the country as well. So um, no, obviously, there is an actual public health laboratory capacity to do those tests. Some of it now depends on need and whether people actually need to test that many in order to ensure that they don't have community transmission. I think that's the most important. Two is that, as you've heard, every day we're managing laboratory supplies. Right now, we're addressing provinces' needs, uh, but that is a very dynamic situation. So. One day it could be managing swabs, the next day it could be reagents. But all we can say is that right now, with all the different streams um, um, of um, increasing laboratory capacity, we, that, that capacity is continuing to increase uh, as, as we speak. But even in the last week, I think it was within the last week, you've heard about some of the newer point of care tests that we're hoping to um, uh, put in place as well. But some of those are new innovations. And so um, the Spartan test, for example, uh, required further testing. So every day there's a dynamic in that laboratory uh, uh, testing approach or strategy. So it could be a number of different factors. Uh, right now, I'm not hearing anything specific about swabs or about reagents. But I'm not saying that next week or the week after, something suddenly wouldn't happen. But right now, based on all the provincial territorial, uh, particularly provincial uh, laboratory capacity, this is the capacity that they uh, have in place. It's Dr. Numevic. I can just build on what doc Dr. Tam has said. Uh, as we, we both said repeatedly during this week, uh, it's all about testing sort of the right people at the right time in the right place. So I just want to maybe unpack that a bit. So first of all, it, it doesn't make sense to just test people randomly. If people don't actually have the infection, what you're actually doing then is that by testing these people, you have a higher chance of getting what we call false positives. There's no test in the world that's 100% foolproof. And so you can imagine if you test a whole bunch of people who actually don't have the infection, then all you'll end up well, most likely is with a bunch of, quote, false positive results. So that's why it's important to test the right people who actually you think, obviously from a public health and clinical point of view, actually have the infection. So that gets to the second point in terms of at the right time. Uh, as we all know, the molecular test that we're using right now is all based on sort of detecting, detecting the virus. And it may well be, as we all know, if you test someone if, who might actually really be infected with the virus, but they're still within the early part of what we call their incubation period, that means the viral load might not actually be high enough. So if you were to give a test at the, sort of the wrong time or too early, you'll actually get a, a negative result. And then three, four, five, six days later, they may actually then develop the symptoms and have high enough a viral load to actually get a, 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 a true positive result. So you might actually give a false assurance to someone with a negative test if you've tested them too early. 
Uh, the other point, though, is sort of, like you say, in the right place. And so, uh, as Dr. Tams pointed out, uh, we're certainly, uh, with the provinces and territories, focusing on those high-risk situations. If there's an outbreak in, the, for example, a long-term care facility or in a prison setting, of course you need to focus on testing and have, a quote, a higher level of uh, diagnostic suspicion and testing uh, uh, both uh, the residents and, and, and the staff in those types of settings. And then the last point, which I think maybe people may not quite understand, is that if you do a test at a certain point in time and you get a negative result, that doesn't clear you. It just means that up to that point, you haven't been exposed, you have not been infected, and test is negative. But if you go out afterwards and sort of, you know, forget about all of the proper uh, sort of uh, measures that should be uh, taking place, like physical distancing, et cetera, and expose yourself, you may well still get exposed and get uh, infected with the virus. So a negative test result also doesn't clear you sort of from that point on. So I think those are the kinds of details that maybe uh, uh, need to be, I think, uh, further underlined by both, both Dr. Tam and myself uh, going forward. Thank you. Okay, but my question Thank you, Dr. Really Althea. It's one about... question, one follow-up. Sorry. No, no, I you have, you have colleagues question... waiting. Sorry. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. The next question, the prochaine question, is from Catherine Levesque de la Presse Canadienne. A vous la parole. Oui, bonjour. Juste une précision d'abord de la ministre Qualcho. Euh, J'aimerais savoir, les travailleurs de garderie et les enseignants là, qui seront nombreux à retourner au travail là, dans les prochains jours au Québec, est-ce qu'ils peuvent refuser de travailler et avoir quand même droit à la prestation canadienne d'urgence? Alors, merci pour la question. C'est vraiment mon, mon, mon message. C'est que la solution, c'est de travailler avec les milieux de travail pour qu'ils soient sécuritaires et que la santé, c'est absolument la priorité de ces employeurs. Mais au Canada, aussi dans la loi, on a le droit de refuser le, le travail qui n'est pas sécuritaire. Mais ça, ce n'est pas ce qu'on veut que les personnes font. On veut que les, les travailleurs, les officiers de la santé publique, les, les employeurs, les, les milieux de travail travaillent ensemble pour assurer qu'il y a le, les, les environnements sécuritaires. Nous voulons que les personnes retournent au travail. Mais ça doit être sécuritaire et sain. Catherine, on suivi. Oui, merci. Et euh, mon, mes, mon autre question, en fait, c'est pour le ministre Guilbeault euh, sur votre annonce d'aujourd'hui. Euh, je ne sais pas si c'est la fatigue ou parce que c'est vendredi, mais je ne comprends pas exactement à quoi va servir l'argent. Euh, donc, je me demandais si vous pouviez là, nous décrire le plus précisément possible comment cet argent-là, ben, à quoi ça va servir, considérant que ces organismes-là, euh, de ce que j'en comprends, des documents d'information, ne pourront pas bénéficier de la subvention salariale ou, ou d'autres programmes du gouvernement là, pour couvrir leurs dépenses s'ils acceptent cet argent-là. D'abord, merci pour la question. Et en fait, je tiens à préciser la dernière partie de votre, euh, votre question. Ce n'est pas parce qu'une organisation recevrait des fonds de ce que nous annonçons aujourd'hui qu'elle ne peut pas recevoir d'autres aides, que ce soit la subvention salariale, par exemple, ou d'autres mécanismes que nous avons mis en place. Ce que nous, annon ce que nous, ce que nous annonçons aujourd'hui essentiellement, c'est que nous reconnaissons que le secteur des arts, de la culture et des sports euh, sont des secteurs tellement particuliers qu'ils ont besoin d'une attention particulière et que certaines des mesures que nous avons mises en place ne fonctionnent pas nécessairement ou pas autant dans ces secteurs-là qu'elles le font dans d'autres secteurs. Si vous êtes un organisme à but non lucratif, il peut être très difficile pour vous d'aller à la banque pour obtenir du crédit, euh, puisque vous avez une marge de manœuvre déjà passablement limitée. Euh, beaucoup de, de, de travailleurs autonomes dans, dans le secteur également, qui sont évidemment éligibles à la prestation canadienne d'urgence, mais donc, ce que, ce que nos mesures visent à faire, c'est de venir combler certains certains manquements qui, qui, qui sont apparus au cours des dernières semaines suite aux annonces que nous avons faites. On comprend très bien qu'on essaie d'aider le plus grand nombre possible de Canadiens, de Canadiennes et le plus grand nombre d'organisations mais que nos mesures ne fonctionnent pas nécessairement pour tout le monde. Alors, c'est une reconnaissance de ça. Donc, euh, précisément, ben, euh, précisément euh, 72 millions pour, pour le sport, voyez-vous, je vous donne un exemple concret. C'est généralement euh, grâce aux Olympiques que, que les athlètes, euh, les, les Jeux olympiques et paralympiques, que, que les athlètes 
peuvent se qualifier pour recevoir le support de l'État. Or là, évidemment, les Jeux sont reportés d'un an. Qu'est-ce qu'on fait? Bien, on va venir aider les athlètes qui étaient déjà qualifiés à poursuivre leur entraînement jusqu'en 2021. Et on va aussi mettre en place un programme qui va permettre ce qui aurait été normalement le cas. Il y a de nouveaux, de nouveaux athlètes, de nouvelles athlètes qui seraient arrivés dans le système pour, après les Olympiques, pour se préparer pour les prochains. Alors, on, on met en place un mécanisme qui va permettre de faire ça. Euh, ce, ce, ces argents-là vont servir à financer des, des organisations qui sont déjà supportées par Patrimoine canadien et plusieurs de nos partenaires, Téléfilm, le, le Conseil canadien des arts et, et plusieurs autres. Mais aussi, on va en garder une partie pour des organisations qui ne reçoivent pas de financement déjà de, 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 du ministère du patrimoine ou de d'autres organisations. Donc, on est bien conscient que les, les, les programmes que nous avons présentement aident beaucoup d'organisations, beaucoup d'artistes et beaucoup d'athlètes, mais pas tout le monde. Alors, compte tenu de, de, de l'étendue de la crise, on, on s'est dit on va mettre en place un, 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 un nouveau programme pour aider ces, ces, ces organisations-là. Merci, M. le ministre. On va prendre une dernière question dans la salle. I believe Sean had a question. Photo Department. My question is for Freeland. Is the U.S.'s haste to reopen good or bad for Canada? We are very clear in Canada that Canadian leaders and Canadian people make decisions about what's right for Canada. And I think none of us would appreciate it if other countries were to offer verdicts or judgments on our decisions. And I think that's the right attitude to take. Yeah, my uh, my follow-up is actually a separate question, and it is for Tam. Um, elderly people that are at home that have been being very safe and not going out and getting a, maybe a friend or a neighbor to do their groceries, is it safe for them to go do their groceries right now? So I think that depends on where you are, and it would be up to really listen to your local medical officer of health, because I do think that, as I've said, Ford the, the other day, Ford the other day said that medical officers, you know, weren't doing what they need to be doing. So without this information in each area, how can people make the decision to know out, to know whether to go out and be safe? So I think, as everyone knows, that people of uh, older age are at much higher risk of um, severe outcomes. And you, where you are really matters right now because the disease activity is different and the local medical office of health is in the best position to do that. Of course, having said that, in many communities, there are different um, approaches that people have taken. Like even in grocery stores, people have a certain hour where perhaps seniors can go and shop as opposed to, you know, other age groups. So there, there's many ways in which I think different communities are looking at how they support the seniors, because it is very important that they be able to, um, you know, have those connections and be able to do what they need to do um, to sustain daily uh, uh, activities. But it is actually very different if you were living in, you know, um, different cities or different towns. So you do have to ask that question of your local uh, public health. Thank you, Dr. Ceci Mefer, la conférence de presse pour aujourd'hui. Thank you. Merci. The conference has now ended. Please disconnect your lines at this time.